In this video, I'll be going through the Z80 and how to code with no RAM. That's right, no RAM. If you watched one of my previous videos, you would recognize this computer. This is the MicroComp, a three chip Z80 computer built with no RAM. That's right, no RAM. No way to save any variable data, no way to save any scores or updates or anything. It just has a ROM, a Z80, and a latch here to save the data on these LEDs. An interesting comment that came out of this computer is that it's, well, at least it's a good Z80 tester. So it's a computer that just doesn't do much at all, apart from have some fancy lights. In the previous video, I talked about a particular program that I wrote or reverse engineered called Mastermind. I spoke about it, I was pretty proud about the game, but I never got to show it. So this video will go through that Mastermind game, how I got it programmed onto this single board computer, and more importantly, how I got it to work with no RAM at all. It was certainly a programming challenge for me. So let's now demonstrate the Mastermind program. I'll flick across to the upper ROM, Blackjack, this is my menu driver, and there's Mastermind. It's pretty hard to get an M out of these seven segments, but this is Mastermind. And I'll run it. What we see here now is just the four numbers that it's trying to generate, a random generator here, and I'm just outputting the essentially the four digits. And you can see there's a lot of randoms going on. But before I get stuck into this program, let's have a look what's in, and more importantly, what's out of the Z80 language that you can't use when you don't have any RAM. One of the important features of the Z80 CPU is the ability to use a stack. Now the stack is a temporary storage area specifically for CPU operations. And if using the stack, it needs to be placed in RAM. The stack is primarily used for storing register data and addresses. Let's now have a look at the basic principles of the stack. Let's say we've got a stack of lemons and there's a tube where the lemons go into. In order to remember where the top of the stack is, you'll need some sort of pointer and that's the stack pointer. This is one of the CPU registers. Now let's start pushing lemons onto the stack. The first lemon, each bit of data that goes onto the stack is 16 bits or two bytes. And we'll push another lemon. Each time the stack pointer goes upwards, but really it actually goes downwards. Think about it as an upside down tube of lemons. So the stack pointer actually decreases by two bytes every time something goes onto the stack. Okay, let's start popping these lemons off. One at a time, stack pointer increases, and the last one comes off. Now can that stack actually get full or overflow? Well, it can. So when the stack runs out of space, let's say if the stack pointer is set at 100 hex, and now it is at zero hex because it's full, well, it just rotates around to the, to the end of the memory. But you've got to be careful putting too much onto the stack because it will eventually corrupt actual RAM data that you need for your program. And you might have heard of the term stack overflow. So when dealing with no RAM on the CPU, what's in, what's out, this is what's out. We can't use the call and return operators, neither the restart. The restart is essentially the same as a call and return, just that it only uses one byte. You can't save any data to memory using those brackets on the left-hand side, so a load, for instance. And you can't use push and pop to save registers onto the stack. Let's have a look how call return and push pop work on the stack. I've set the stack pointer to 100 hex. Let's have a look what happens to the stack when this code executes. Red is the program counter, green is the stack pointer. I load BC with 15 FE and DE with 0918. Then I push BC onto the stack. That saves the register BC onto the stack, 15 FE. Stack pointer moves down to, to FE. Now I push DBE onto the stack. Again, that saves 0918. I do a call. A call will place the address of the next line onto the stack so it knows where to 
regime execution of the code when the call routine is finished. So it places 090B onto the stack. Then we jump to the call routine. It does a load here, so it could essentially corrupt B now. That's fine, we've saved that onto the stack. Do it in command, and on the return, it pops the address off the stack and places it into the program counter. So 090B, and continues execution. Pop DE, pops that off, and loads the DE register with 0918, and pop BC, that will overwrite the register of BC to 15FE, how it was originally. And if you notice here, the program counter just moves downwards, so it's now it's back into the jump routine, which, you know, you might not want to do. So when it eventually gets to the return, what actually happens, you don't really know. It will actually just jump to the location stored at 100 hex, whatever that is. So you've got to be careful to cleanly exit your code. Okay, so if these operators are out, how do we replace them? What can we replace them with? So call and return, well, a call and return essentially just jumps using the stack, but we can just use the jump routines. So if I save the next line of the call routine in HL, IX or IY, and then when I jump to the routine I want to call or jump to, to return back, I would use a jump bracket HL, IX or IY. That will then jump to the location stored in HL, which is quant in this example. Restart is effectively the same. Load, well, we can't load into memory at all, so we need to use the registers to save our data. And the registers that you can use here are A, obviously, B, C can be used together, D, E can also be used together or individually, and H, L together or individually. You can use I, X, I, Y, they're the index registers. You can even use the stack pointer because, hey, we can't use the stack anymore, but we can save data into the stack pointer and retrieve it again. And we can also use I if you're not using interrupt level two. And with push pop, we can use the exchange command. Now, not only the Z80 has a whole heap of registers, it also has shadow registers that you can swap between and have a totally new set of registers to use. And you would swap those shadow registers in and out by using the EXX operator or exchange AF and AF. So it's effectively a one level stack. I'm pretty sure you would have heard of the game Mastermind. It's a game used with colored tokens that someone places four different colored tokens and you have to try to guess those tokens. And they'll give you clues about how accurate you are by telling you how many colored tokens are in the right spot and how many color tokens are correct but in the wrong spot. We don't have color tokens on the micro comp, but I've got numbers, and this is how the general game will go. The number I'm trying to find is 4723, and I'll take a guess, 8390. As you can see, there's the number three is in the answer, but not in the correct spot, so I'll return a zero one. I'll try again, 1865. I think, well, maybe the eight is the correct one, and I'll just put it in a different spot but nothing's right, so all those numbers are not used. Have another go, 9423. Two are in the correct spot, as you can see two and three are, but four isn't. So I take a, another guess and think maybe it's the seven, and yes, seven is used, so there's two in the right spot, which is, I assume, 23, and seven, four, maybe swapped around. I swap them around, I get the correct answer, I get four and zero. So this is what I wanna produce on the microcomp, something similar to this. But how do I do that with no RAM? Now, if you did have RAM, this will be pretty straightforward to program. Let's say you got 4723, you will just place it in memory somewhere. I just chose OE00, and you'll use some routine just on the right, like I've got shown here, which will just loop through the four bytes in memory and compare each value to the answer. But I can't use RAM, so, this is the solution I came up with. Since I can only use registers to store data, each register is eight bits, but each number is only four bits, I can store the complete number in two registers. And it's convenient to use one of those double registers like DE or BC. So effectively what I want to do is a 16-bit rotation, popping off the first four bits, let's say four, doing something with it, analyzing the four, and then pushing it back to E. So something like this, where I just rotate four bits at a time, 
storing A as my working register to manage the four and to compare it with the answer. But you know what? There is no 16-bit rotations on the Z80. So how do we do 16-bit rotations? It's actually quite straightforward. And this is how you do it. You use a combination of shifting and rotating. And in particular, you use the carry flag to manage those bits that you want to rotate around the other end. Here's my example using DE to store 9485. I store it into DE. And then I use a shift routine, which will just shift D to the left by one bit. So bit number seven, which is one at the moment, will then go into the carry flag, and bit number zero will just be replaced with a zero. And all the other bits will be shifted left one bit. And there's the shift with one in the carry. Now I use a rotate left on E, which will then place whatever's in the carry on bit zero and whatever's on bit seven back into the carry flag. The carry was one, bit seven was one on E, so it's carry is still one. Now if bit seven was zero on E, then that's perfectly fine because we've already shifted zero into the bit zero of D. Otherwise, if there is a carry, I just increase D by one. And there's the increase. And now we've done a one bit, 16 bit rotation. If you do that four times, then you get the DE register rotating by one rotation. And the new numbers are four, eight, five, and nine. With a little extra code, you can easily create 16 bit rotations. Okay, let's now play the game. I press the B button. It has now saved the correct answer that I'm trying to find. And I now have to select four digits and take a guess. So we'll do five, submit it. It has a little fancy rotation display there to show that you've submitted the first number. Select the second number, third number, and let's try four. Now I've entered four, it will peep at the, the numbers to me. Let's have a look at the numbers again, five, two, one, and four, and it's telling me I have no numbers correct in the right spot and one number that is correct but in the wrong spot. Okay, I'll try again. Now let's try two, six, seven, and if I go to nine, goes back to zero again, two, six, seven, zero. Okay, I've got one number in the correct spot and none of the other, none of the other numbers are correct. So now it's a matter of eliminating the numbers, working out which numbers are in the correct spot and the ones that we aren't gonna use. And eventually I need to get a four here and a zero there. So all four numbers in the correct spot. So I'll just be right back and uh, try to work this out myself. Okay, I'm getting closer. One, six, three, and eight, I think are the numbers. One, six, three, and eight. Okay, I've got two right and two in the incorrect spot. So I'll take a guess, one, six are in the correct spot. And what's the other two? Three and eight. Eight and three the other way around. So one, six, eight, and three. One, six, eight, three. Yes, I found the answer, 1683. Okay, so let's now have a look at how I actually implemented this in the code. Now, I can show you the whole code and walk through it, but yeah, that's a bit boring, and it's something you guys can, if you're really interested, have a look at yourself. It's on the GitHub page. But let's have a look at one part of the code, which saves the the player's answer in DE when they key it in from the A and B buttons. So firstly, I would store C with four, which is the four numbers to input. So use as, a, as an outer counter. I would reset DE to zero, zero. That's where we're gonna store the player's guess. And then I'll 
call some routine to handle the input of the keyboard, you know, wait for the user to press the key to select the number. Once they've selected the number, the number gets stored in the register L. So how do we get the number stored into DE? I'd first load A with the number itself, and I'll shift the current values of DE to the, to the left or from the right. First, I would OR A with E. Now what that does, that effectively adds A to E. Now, A is currently a number between 0 and 9, which is stored in the lower four bits or the lower nibble. So whatever's in the upper nibble of E will be retained as the upper nibble of A is O as 0. Now the result gets stored into back into E, so I load E with A, and I need to check how many numbers are being keyed in, so I load C into A, because A is my working register. I decrease A, that's a one way of checking for 0, which is slightly quicker than a subtract 1 from A, and if it's 0, then I exit the routine. But if it's not 0, I need to save another value into the DE register, so I do my 16-bit rotation here. Load B as 4, and like we've seen before, I do the shift left with carry, then I'll rotate D to the left by 1, setting bit 0 with the carry flag. And in this case, because I don't care what bit 7 is on DE, because it's going to be overwritten by the number when I key it in, so I don't need to check for carry and increase E by 1, because E, again, will be updated with the user key up here. So I skip that step and just do a rotate. Do that four times, and there's our rotation. As you can see, the code's not that complicated. Once you get the general concept of what's needed with those bit rotations, putting the game together wasn't that difficult, but it was certainly a challenge without using RAM and just using registers only. And if someone else comes up with a better idea or a different way to, to do this, please post in the comments. Well, this micro comp has been a bit of a hit for me online. And the way that I did code this could be uh, changed. Uh, maybe there's someone else out there who knows how to do this a bit better. But when you're limited with only registers to use, uh, this is the solution I came up with, and it does work quite well. So I just want to show you what's coming up next. I've got this beautiful single board computer, the Talking Electronics, brand new Tech 1F. It's got an upgrade from 2Ks of RAM and ROM to 8Ks. A keyboard here, which you can use two different style of tactile switches. And something I'm looking very forward to, built-in serial transmission here. Although you do have to code it yourself. It's just a beautiful board, as you can see. Well designed. And I'm going to look forward to building this. This will be on my next video. And you could also have the opportunity to build this yourself. With this Tech 1F board, wait till you hear the backstory of the designer who built this Tech 1F or designed the Tech 1F. You thought the micro comp was controversial? Well, wait till you find out who designed this board. And it is ultra controversial, but with a happy ending. Thanks again for watching. I hope you found this video interesting. It's a bit of a hardcore Z80 programming topic today. So it might, not, it might not interest everyone, but I certainly had fun programming this single board computer. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you again.